So are we live now? Yes, we are. Okay. So shall I wait for a short moment? I see participants coming in. Yes, well, let's wait for another yeah. minute, perhaps, yeah. so people can connect. Uh, the team in Tanzania, can you hear us? Yes? Okay. So maybe when I give you the word, you will have to unmute there. I think you can hear. Can, can you hear us, Wilco? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Thank okay. you, Roger. Yes. Okay, great. So I see also Julie coming in from the UK. I think that um, people will start coming in, but I think it's uh, because of time's sake, we make a, a start with this very special webinar of global and humanitarian uh, nurse surgery. And it's very special because it's uh, for two things. Uh, one is the special issue of brain and spine. That was the reason why we wanted to have this webinar being done with a lot of publications globally all, for, all over the world. And the other one is that it's the one year um, anniversary after the last meeting when we had the interview in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Um, and happily, I cannot be there in Dar es Salaam because I'm in Suriname, so the other part of the world in South America. And um, so we have a combined meeting between the ENS Global Committee and also the Dar es Salaam course. And um, I'm very happy that uh, we have excellent speakers. We start uh, in a moment with uh, Dr. Ruta, which name I cannot pronounce quite well because it's Dr. Nisiforos Ruta Bitswa. He is the host in Dar es Salaam. And after that, uh, Professor Roger Hertel, who we all know for the minimal invasive spine surgery, but also because of the global work. Dr. Julie Woodfield, who was a fellow until recently, but now I think she's now back in the UK, but she will tell something about it herself. Yes, but she was a former global neurosurgery fellow in Tanzania. And uh, the other global neurosurgery fellow is Magli Kadjeu. Um, she is my co-moderator. I don't see her, but if I fall out because of bad internet, Magali will take over, she promised me. And um, then we have Dr. Ondra Petter, who is very well known in Tanzania. He was last year with me together at the course, uh, which is now being held. Uh, I think that Magali is coming in now. Yeah. And, um, and he has also organized a course where he'll tell about about cranial surgery later in 2023. And uh, Dr. Magnus Tiesel, who will talk, who has a lot of experience in global uh, neurosurgery and humanitarian neurosurgery. He's from Gothenburg, Sweden. He's also our section chair of the ENS Global and Humanitarian Neurosurgery. So I'm very happy that we all are here and uh, I don't want to take too much time. So I start, I, um, we will start with Dr. Ruta from Tanzania. And for those people who are online and want to ask questions, please place them in the chat so I can see them and we can coordinate. So I give the word to Dr. Ruta from Tanzania. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dr. Ruta. Uh, my full name is Dr. Nesporas Kutabaswa. I am a neurosurgeon at the Muimbido Orthopedic Institute, which is located in Tanzania, Dar es Salaam. Uh, our activity, the main activity in our department is we see all range of neurosurgical cases, uh, starting with the neurotrauma. In neurotrauma, we mean traumatic brain injury and the traumatic spine injury. The traumatic spine injury ranges from the upper cervical spine all the way to thoracolumbar spine. Uh, and then we deal with the patients with the neuro-oncological problems, that would mean the brain tumors and the spinal cord tumors. And the brain tumors, we have both intraaxial and the axial, uh, extraaxial spine, I mean tumor, and the intramedullary and the extramedullary spine tumors. As well, we see patients with the hemorrhagic as well as ischemic strokes, and uh, we have patients with the 
intra uh, cerebral hemorrhages. We have vascular patients. So we see all range of cases here. This is our activity. And uh, we are happy that we are able to do the things because we have different collaborators. Uh, currently, we have a collaboration with the uh, Way Cornell in matter of the global neurosurgery, but we are going ahead uh, collaborating with some other people in Europe, especially as far as the humanitarian is concerned. For the cases of scar base and vascular surgeries, we are trying to form some training activities in the Cossexa region uh, uh, regarding, I mean, being uh, in collaboration with our associates in Europe and in, in America. And uh, we are also having uh, training activities for the residencies, both for university and the Cossexa region. Uh, our strength is the collaborations which we have in, in, in regard to the strengthening of neurosurgical services in our countries. And as you may know that probably in the region, we face the same challenges, the gaps which we face are almost the same in regard to the diagnostic uh, management and the, the disposal of our patients. Like if I say the patient with a traumatic brain injury or spine injury, the rehabilitation issues, the implants, and the, also the neurocritical care. So all those things are the uh, activities which we do. And we are happy that we have partners who have agreed uh, with, their, with their strength to just help us to show us the way so that we can be as near as the first world and they assist the uh, emerging great number of patients with neurosurgical services. Uh, as you may know, in Tanzania, we are uh, lucky that our government has installed almost all uh, uh, CT scans in all the regions of Tanzania. We have almost like 28 to 30 regions. Every regional hospital has a CT scan. So the diagnosis of a neurological problems is going to be high, and we expect to get a lot of patients who are will be requiring the neurosurgical services, both traumatic, uh, neuro oncology, and vascular. This uh, means that we need to have training, even at the primary levels, where we normally did not see the patients from there because of the inavailability of the diagnostic services. With that remarks and the opening, uh, maybe I will talk later. Thank you. And then I may pass it to, to another speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Huta. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction of this uh, webinar. And um, well, we know that you did already a lot of work together with Roger. I forgot to um, say this, this in the beginning that also Michael Blessing is here from Uganda. He was also a teacher last year. And I will be the last speaker of this webinar, who is sitting besides Roger. Uh, also, welcome, Michael, to this webinar. Um, the next speaker is Roger, uh, who deals with us and the experience with his organizing the course in Dar es Salaam and worldwide. Please, Roger. Thank you, Vilko. Thank you for having us here. It's a, um, it's a pleasure to see everybody on the screen. We have an almost full audience here. Some people are still on coffee break, but uh, you're all being watched very carefully here in Tanzania. And uh, I think I'll be fine. Yeah, I'll... Uh, it's a wonderful collaboration. And I, I, I'll say a few words about the collaboration here with the Institute and Dar es Salaam that Dr. Ruta so eloquently outlined. And this is totally different from what 15 years ago was present, you know, 15 years ago, uh, was a small group of three neurosurgeons, and, and those were the only neurosurgeons for all of Tanzania. They were all at the same hospital. And now we have a much, much greater number of neurosurgeons, and not only neurosurgeons, but also subspecialized surgeons. You know, as Dr. Ruta mentioned, we just, we had a wonderful presentation by Dr. Alpha about endovascular surgery that is being done now. Andra from 
from Innsbruck, who's who's here. Obviously, he's been really a forceful, a force of nature in in collaborating with our colleagues at Moy in terms of vascular surgery. Uh, we had uh, the course now, Claudius Tome, who's who's here. He's not here now currently, but he's part of the meeting. He gave some really nice uh, presentations about spine. Uh, related issues and, and also cranial surgery. So all of these things now are really being tackled by the team at Moy, and it's quite remarkable to see that. You know, there has been a construction going on in the hospital. They have endovascular suites now, the radiology is there, an emergency room. It's quite remarkable to see that. And I, I want to say a few words about the collaboration between Moy and Cornell uh, and, and it's not only Cornell, because obviously there's so many faculty from other institutions that have joined over the years, and including you, Vilko. But I want to po just point out what we kind of focused on in terms of the Cornell slash Moy collaboration, which I think can serve as a model or a blueprint for other organizations. And I think what I hear from surgeons frequently is, you know, they ask, well, how do you, how do you get a pro project like this started? And it's, it can be very difficult and very confusing for somebody who has an interest, but they may not have the experience. So, so what we've done over the years, and this was, this grew very, very painfully from many, many failed attempts and experiences. But really what, what turned out to be the, the secret of success was, first of all, you have to have the right institution to work with. And that was initially not the case. I, initially, I went to Buganda, which is a different hospital. And... The problem there was that they just didn't have the infrastructure to do neurosurgery. It was a painful experience because there were patients there who really needed neurosurgery. But I think as somebody who comes in from the outside, if you want to make this a success, you kind of have to accept the reality that you need, you know, you need a CAT scanner, you need person, you need to collaborate with neurosurgeons there. So, so that's number one. And the, the other thing that we realized was that bringing in equipment is not really very helpful unless it's really equipment that has been carefully selected. There are service contracts in place if something breaks down. So we, we, we got away from bringing equipment. We focused really on teaching and training. And what that means then was that we, we had funding, and it's mainly funded through patient donations in New York, fortunately, that we have. It's basically, the program is run by fellows. And, and you have Julie there on the screen, she was one of our fellows here for a year in Dar es Salaam. We have Magali, she's sitting right, you know, almost next to me. Uh, we have so many fellows over the years that really helped us run the program. So those were fully trained, and that's a requirement. They have to be fully trained. They can be young, but they should be fully trained. Neurosurgeons or spine surgeons from North America or Europe who come to uh, Dar es Salaam and spend one, dedicate themselves for one year to stay here, that's really the key to success. And then we have funding for fellows who come from Dar es Salaam to New York, and they spend three months usually to visit and observe. Uh, we had Dr. Shabani there over the years. We have nurses there, ICU doctors, radiologists. Uh, a neuromonitoring person came and started doing monit monitoring here last year, which was a great experience. And, and so, so, so that exchange of fellows and, and students is really vital. And then the third component is really the research that we do, which is really more a registry uh, or the clinical research where we collect data on, on head trauma. We were really focused on head trauma and spine trauma. And uh, we've done that very successfully over the years. But those things together, so the fellowship, the, the research that we do, and having the right place to work with, uh, that has been for us really the key to success. And now... We've done that, so the question is, what, what are we going to do next? So now what, what I see this year, for example, is the expansion in the hospital and the, recognize, the, the, the recognition that subspecialization is really important. And I think that what we will try to do is to really help them build a, a, a strong spine program because spine, as you know, and most of you know, spine is really what kind of floats a neurosurgical department. I think uh, everybody has spine issues, so if you... If you build a program that really takes good care of the patients who need spine care in this country, I think it prevents people from going abroad for, for care. It keeps patients here, which is important for the ego of the physicians here and the hospital, but also financially. And I think 
it is usually something that will help really run a neurosurgical or orthopedic department. So that's kind of what we want to focus on, hopefully, if we have the funds and the support going forward. So that, that was my summary. I just wanted to give you kind of an outline of the program, what I think makes the program successful and where we try to go together in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Roger, and uh, excellent presentation, and also very elegantly because uh, you did a lot of work together with the people in Moy. So uh, thank you for that, and also for making the attention of the importance of the different parts of neurosurgery in uh, in all countries in the world. Um, I get a, a remark from Afghanistan, which shouldn't forget all the parts of the world. So we also have some. Uh, take some attention not only for Africa and South America, but also Asia and also the difficult parts and countries like Afghanistan, uh, which is well known. So I now go to the next speaker. And um, that is Ondra Petter. And uh, I always called Ondra Petter Petter because I thought that Petter was his, uh, his uh, most important name. But Ondra and I met each other for the first time, uh, really, during the course in Dar es Salaam. We had a lot of fun together, and um, he organized the course later in 2023, and he will tell us on behalf of the EANS uh, about his experience uh, in cranial surgery. So, Andra, I don't see you. Are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, yes, I am. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Andra. Hello, hello. Th thank you very much. Uh, so I, um, it is my really pleasure and privilege to to be part of this webinar and to 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 give a, th a very short talk about our experience and uh, about our activities. And uh, I must say, it is uh, it begins uh, within the scope of uh, so-called EANS Global Humanitarian and uh, uh, Humanitarian Committee Twinning pro Program, which is a collaborative between like European neurosurgical institution and institution somewhere in a low income country. And uh, it, uh, this program is always based on the partnership and very close collaboration. And uh, the rule is to completely center the program on the specific needs uh, of the patients served in this low income country. And uh, I must say, I, I was uh, lucky to, to, to get known uh, these wonderful people at, at Moy. And it was all, uh, also thanks to Roger, who, who has been doing a wonderful job in Tanzania and who laid the foundation uh, to to uh, be able to to develop uh, the subspecialty of the of uh, of the neurosurgery which uh, are very important. So so uh, in our uh, course um, we we focused on the subspecialty vascular and skull base uh, neurosurgery and uh, last year in 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 the fall we organized the first skull base and vascular neurosurgical course in Dar es Salaam and it was in my opinion of course I'm a biased, uh, but still a pioneering step towards enhancing uh, neurosurgical capacities uh, in the uh, in this region. And uh, we we uh, focused on improving surgical skills and knowledge in the skull base and vascular neurosurgic. Uh, and uh, we we uh, of course, uh, met some challenges uh, in the early stages. Uh, we we uh, one of the primary challenge was the logistics, but uh, thanks to Moi, we 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 uh, we were able to to overcome and to, uh, secure the venue equipped with the necessary uh, surgical tools and technology and uh, and so on. Then we were able to to invite really a group of of uh, neurosurgical experts uh, from across across the the Europe. So we had we had uh, uh, twenty nine 
uh, lecturers uh, from EANS uh, uh, and in particular seven were the members of our global and humanitarian committee and we had almost 40 keynote lectures really focusing on this workshop. We, we did uh, a daily endovascular workshop and and daily uh, bedside teaching uh, and we we did uh, some life surgeries and also the two endovascular procedures and i must say i uh, i have been doing uh, this this job or this collaboration with with dr ruta with dr Limeri, with dr shabani since uh, almost 10 years and uh, they have been developing and they they do a wonderful wonderful job i'm very very proud of them because uh when i started the the uh, for example ruptured aneurysms uh where uh, or had almost a hundred percent mortality now they 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 are able to achieve a very, very good outcome in these cases. So, so I just, I, I want to say, even in such a region, when uh, one keeps doing and working, we can achieve almost or everything. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Andra. So you are very positive. Um, I think it's also important, but we may need it for the discussion, that it's not easy to, to work when you have a Western background. So people some, sometimes ask us all, well, can I help teaching in a, a country? But to do surgery in, in a country with less facilities is more difficult and also difficult to train. But we will come back to that to the uh, when we have the discussion at the uh, at the final part, so thank you, Andra. So we now go to Magnus Tiesel. Magnus Tiesel was one of the co-editors, together with Andreas Demetriades, was the former president of the ENS, and with uh, Lucas uh, Razulic from uh, Belgrade, who were the special editors of the, or the editors for the special topic issue, which was also the first special topic issue which you run very successfully. And in between, Magnus took over the section chair. Um, Magnus and I don't know each other from Africa, but we know each other from the ethics committee and doing a course together, talking about ethics and DBS for Parkinson. But uh, now I'm very happy to announce uh, Magnus on behalf of the section of ENS. Go on, Magnus. So thank you very much. Uh, can I share the screen? Is it possible? Yes. Which I tried to so try to give my background. This is always the seat now. Yeah, I see okay. it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's okay. Okay, so there's all my affiliations. So, so, so um, I personally am the chair of the Global Humanitarian Committee, and that's what I'm supposed to talk about. But I also give you a few with the background. And I, first, I would like to thank all the, all the guys here at my institute for hosting me during the course this uh, autumn. It was it was really great. It's a fantastic place and I, I look forward to come back to it. So uh, I'm uh, stationed in uh, Göteborg, Sweden, and I have a background. I worked for, for Oslo University Hospital as a medical advisor, and I'm still working there. And I'm also president and founder of the Swedish-African Neurosurgical Collaboration, SANC. Um, so, what we've done, to see if it's, uh, so this is what we've done in Malawi. It's been, uh, this is with Oslo. We've done residence training and capacity building um, in the project in Blantyre. And then in Malawi, we started with one resurgent, Patrick Kamalo, you see on both images. And uh, this was one of my proudest moments this December when the two first residents trained in Malawi, Leonard and Sitte, which I followed all the way uh, graduated and became the first Malawi trained neurosurgeons. Uh, that was a fantastic moment. Uh, but we also tried to to to, to support the neurosurgical uh, um, 
uh, work in all, all ways we can. But this is a government to government uh, project with a lot of funding and with Norway as the most uh, richest country in the world actually per capita. So it's easy to do. Uh, and then also when I come back to Sweden, I started um, um, organization in Sweden called Swedish African Historical Collaboration that actually we encompass all uh, university cities in Sweden and we have done uh, mission and uh, training in, in uh, West Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, and we have places like Liberia and the Gambia with a single surgeon in the country. And lastly, we went to Sierra Leone, actually, where there are zero neurosurgeons. It's a country with 8.5 million people, and they have no neurosurgeon. They have two guys that are training, one in Morocco and one in Venezuela. I have contact with them, and I, I hope we can help them on their way forwards. But it, it's I think it's the largest country in the world without a neurosurgeon, actually. You can correct me on that. Uh, but uh, that's my background. And then... Uh, uh, talk about the Global Humanitarian Committee that was founded, I think, by Andreas, uh, I know, by Andreas de Matraidis, the former president of INS, and Lucas Rasulik, which I think we have on the panel. And um, uh, so Lucas was the first chairman, and they started from zero and uh, as a very, very ambitious project to, to, to get INS more uh, committed to this kind of work. And I have the privilege to to take over after Lucas this autumn in October. And this is the committee. These are all the members of the committee. As you can see, they are from different places in 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 Europe, but also from Curaçao, Elian. Um, but he's also have, a, have an as an affiliation to Netherlands. But this is mostly a committee of people that are committed. It, it has no budget so forth. We have no money. We have just the will to work together and we have the kind of uh, matchmaking possibility to to to, to meet and uh, make other people to meet but we have great plans for the future um if you look at this, this is uh, from the publications from 2015 this is when they have the different neurosurgeons that you have represented in the in the map the larger the country the more neurosurgeons and you can see europe is quite fat it's much fatter. So these are the number persons, neurosurgeons in Europe. And you can see US, China. And look at Africa. This was 2015, but you can see Sub-Saharan Africa has almost vanished. It's nothing. Some people in South Africa and Northern Africa. These things has improved a little bit, but it's still a lot of way to go. So it's obvious that this big lump here should be able to help this film. <laughs> uh, string here that that was one of the, it's obvious and another thing is that europe is quite close to africa we don't have any time lag to deal with uh, what's so it's quite easy uh, in my opinion at least to go to and through africa from europe so one thing that andra talked about was the twinning program twinning is winning and uh, we had the wonderful example of what uh, Roger has done with the Moy Institute, but we have want, like to help to facilitate this in, in Europe. And we have started with the mapping of, of the interested institutions in Europe, other institutions in, in the world. And um, you're welcome to, to take contact with the committee if you if you interested in it. Is how I said, not please, please. There's something with the sound, uh, Mathis. Do you hear me? You don't hear me. Is it, do you hear me now? No, it's better. Yeah, it's better. Yeah. Okay, maybe. I, okay, so training is winning. That was what I said. <laughs> and then uh, a, a dream I shared together with Ondra and, and uh, I hope Ruth as well. Now we, we met is the Continental African Historical Course because I, uh, I, think, uh, we, I have a strong feeling that, and uh, which I share with a lot of other people, that uh, the thing to strengthen the education is to strengthen it locally. And I think the ENS courses are a very good role model for how we can do it on a continental basis from different cultures, different languages that can bring together the faculty and the residents and it form a stronger uh, new circle community in, in a lot of ways. And I think, I mean, the ENS courses are unique in the world in that way. And I think it's a very, very good template that we really would like to bring down to, to, to Africa if you, if, 
people who want it. And we have had a lot of discussion with people from Cairns, Svax, Quasexa. And we ended up now with a committee uh, that Andra has put a lot of work in to, to put together. So we hope for a course in, in, in this autumn as a first starting course with local faculty, local residents, and some European faculty if needed, and uh, uh, help with organization. So I think this will be a fantastic thing to have it running and going. But uh, we need uh, sponsors, we need a lot of other things, but uh, I think most things can be solved. And then uh, we also have some webinars apart from this. So I just want to get attention to the webinars that we plan this year. In a few weeks, we will have global aspects of neurotrauma with representation from South America, Africa, and uh, Asia, actually. So it's extremely global and talk about the global problem in neurotrauma. In, and in June, we will talk about the training in the low income settings. And in November, we will have a hopefully with, with the ethical legal committee about the ethical legal aspects in global neurosurgery, which I think at least is a very interesting subject. And this will, uh, the webinars are run by Nick Bulo and Eliane, that are doing a great job putting this together. And then uh, fi finally, Nicolo as well and others are working with a guideline for training projects. We thought about it. Uh, I, I, I at least have done most mistakes you can do in my <laughs> missions to, and to Africa. And I think a lot of mistakes you can avoid. And I think it could be good to have some ENS-based guidelines for how, how should you do these projects in different ways. And we have started with... Uh, qualitative study. We have not st started with interviews, but we start with the framework. I would like to interview people from both from low income settings and from, from Europe. And based on that, we will have a workshop pre-Congress, hopefully in Sofia before the ENS Congress to come, up, come out with, with the final guidelines. And uh, finally, at the ENS Congress this uh, autumn, uh, we will have a sessions. We have a pl plenary sessions about working in low income countries, how to start the journey. And that is a little bit what we touch upon here. Another thing, it's a parallel session. It will be about training programs and modern technology in low income countries, challenges, and possibilities. So you're very welcome to join us in, in Sofia in October. So this is a little bit about the Global Humanitarian Committee so far. And Andra has to correct me if I forget something very important. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Magnus. Uh, maybe you can close your shared screen. Yeah, I managed. Yeah, right, thank you. Uh, one, one, one short question to you before we go uh, yeah, yeah, to please. the next speaker. Uh, um, if you look at this map with a very fat Europe and also a very fat North America, yeah. Uh, did you have the idea in the past, or your former Lucas or Andreas, to connect with the double ANS to work together, um, to 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 work from North America and Europe to work together at the lower middle income country training? Yeah, Lucas has been here longer, but I, at the last ENS Congress, I, I spoke with Dempsey, uh, for instance, and he will come to ENS in Sofia as well. And uh, so, so obviously, this is one big point you can touch upon: the, how we coordinate things and don't do things parallel, run parallel things. I think there's a lot of things to be to be gained that way. So you don't do things parallel, or or or, or and you can get a lot of um, um, good things out from from cooperating. Uh, absolutely. Okay. So yeah, but I mean, we we are still in a very early stage. I would say our committee. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Magnus. So yeah, then we thank go you. To, thank you. And then we go to the next speaker. There's Judy Woodfield, which I learned to know last year in Dar es Salaam. She is now back in the UK, I think. She was at that moment a fellow at um, at the Moy Institute, and she was very hardworking to to have the meeting of last year. I still remember her sweating and running around when we had also the interviews. So Julie, please uh, come forward to the screen. And uh, I don't see you here now. Oh. Yeah. I am here. I'm just going to try and share my screen as well. I don't know. Yeah. Ooh, what do you see? Do you see it now? It's perfect yeah, now. Yeah, Thank we you. can see it. 
Perfect. Good. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, my name is Julia Woodfield and I'm so grateful to be able to be here today. And I want to say hello to everyone currently in Dar es Salaam. I'm missing you all and I wish I could be there with you, but I couldn't. Um, as way of background, I spent between 2022 to 2023 in Dar es Salaam as the Global Neurosurgery Fellow. So that's a paid position from Weill Cornell Medicine. Um, but to work at Mohimbili Orthopaedic Institute there. So prior to that, I had completed neurosurgery training mostly in Scotland, in the UK, and then a fellowship in paediatric neurosurgery. And on coming back to the UK, I've actually just moved to a new job. So I'm working as a um, locum paediatric neurosurgeon in Bristol. So I was just going to briefly share my experiences of more for the people listening at home around the world rather than the people in the hall in Dar es Salaam um, about what I learned over the year I spent um, working outside of the country in which I'd trained as a neurosurgeon. Um, so this is just a picture of Mohambili, but as I said, everyone there will be very familiar. Um, my experience working in the UK was of working in really strong institutions with strong histories. So I would learn every day from radiologists, from laboratory scientists, from pathologists, from the anaesthetists, from the physiotherapists. And actually, in some ways, they all support the whole network of neurosurgery. And if an institution does neurosurgery for a long time, then all those people might know your job better than you particularly when you're starting out in the field and they will support you and hold you up. But I think in some parts of the world where that whole historical system is not there, then it's very different when the reality is that the neurosurgeon is leading the team and propping up a network of care. And sometimes that network is slightly incomplete, whether that's with missing ambulance services or missing rehabilitation services or anything in between. And neurosurgeons who work in such situations, actually I have a great amount of respect for these people. And on return to the UK, I think I've really learned to appreciate all the expertise around me, which helps keeps the patient safe at all times and gets the best outcomes. And I think we have to be really aware when we're designing future collaborative efforts that it's a whole team and a whole systems approach. And it's actually the whole care system, not just the surgery that keeps patients safe and gets good outcomes and facilitates really good holistic care. But another key learning point for me, I think, is asking good questions and checking when things don't make sense. So I'm probably going to be in great trouble for putting this photo up at the end of a charity race. But this is a charity race at Moy. We're a little bit sweaty because in Dar es Salaam, it's 30 degrees Celsius a lot of the time. And it's a good going humidity a lot of the time. So when they told me in English that the race starts at 12, I think that's a really silly time to, to run a race. Why would the race start at 12? And then I realized, oh no, we aren't doing 12 o'clock. We're doing six o'clock. It must be six o'clock in the morning. And we're gonna do Swahili time, not English time, even though they've told me the race starts at 12. And you have to check with people. And it's a good life lesson, I think, just to double check the information you're getting. Don't think oh, everyone else is silly and they really want to run a race at midday in 30 degrees. They don't. They all want to start at six o'clock. It's just there's a confusion about the timing. And also working in a collaboration, which is a collaborative effort between the US and Tanzania. Actually, you might find sometimes it's the US side of things that is confusing. There are lots of US terminologies that as a British English speaker, I don't know what's going on sometimes. And I have to check and ask because the people might be talking about exactly the same thing as you. But if I say football, they say football, we mean something totally different. They have to say soccer when I say football for me to know what's going on. And sometimes the UK and Tanzania might actually align more than the other collaborators. Um, and so just talking to other people and making sure that everyone understands what's going on in the same, the same version of the same, even when it's the same language, it can be pretty confusing sometimes. I think another thing that really stood out for me while I was in Dar es Salaam is the privilege of being able to follow up your patients. So my patient, I can scan them post-operatively and I can see them in clinic. If you can't scan your patient post-operatively and you never see them again in clinic, it's really hard to learn from that. 
And I think a lot of us take that pretty much for granted that we will find out how well we did. But if that option is not there to find out how well you did, then it can be pretty challenging to know whether what you did was the right thing. Even following up patients over time, so looking at trends and data, if you don't have that data, then you don't know what you're doing. And so efforts to try to collect that data and try to follow up patients, actually, these are the sort of things where we can make a real difference in trying to actually improve things for, for patients locally. Um, this is another interesting thing that I came across while living in Dar es Salaam. So this is a map of uh, flight routes from major cities in Africa. It's much, much easier to get to the Middle East and to get to Europe than it is to get between neighboring countries. And I think there are a lot of historical reasons for this. And many of them come from sort of post-colonial issues. Um, but if you can get more easily between a European city and an African city than you can between neighboring cities, and you can't follow up your patients locally and you don't have local data, then we're really missing out on the opportunity from learning from neighboring countries. So Dar es Salaam, um, so I mean, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, all East African, and they all have really good neurosurgery setups. And I know Dr. Blessing is there just now in Dar es Salaam. Um, and last year we had Sylvia, and I think there's a video clip later from, from the, the three of them that are gonna be shown during this webinar. But actually trying to get people together can be really challenging. It's not like within Europe. If I move to the next map, if you look at Europe, these are flight paths across the world. And uh, you can go between any European city. It's just a blur. It's been sort of <laughs> uh, blurred out. Um, and I think we really take it for granted that we can go to a neighboring country but actually the, the travel arrangements can be quite challenging for financial reasons, but also just because the links aren't there. But I think this map also gives us a hint that neurosurgery is global and all of these places in the world, um, if they don't have neurosurgeons already, then, you know, they are coming. And it gives us a great opportunity to link up with people across the global neurosurgery forum um, and work with all of our neighbours, however close they are or how far away they are, and try and build links so that we can really push the field of global neurosurgery forwards and try and improve neurosurgical care for people across the world. Thank you very much, Julie. So back from Dar es Salaam to Bristol, so now it's very cold and rainy there. So, Have my jumper. Uh, <laughs> different worlds. Well, thank you very much and uh, thank you also for all the work you did in the past year uh, and also especially the course last year and i don't know if there is time uh, later on to to show the video but on the, otherwise it will be shown on the website uh, because uh, we have still one speaker to go and not the least you already mentioned him uh, we go back to the to the room in Dar es Salaam to dr michael blessing and i know dr michael blessing i, I saw him operating on a pituitary case last year, which was quite impressive. He trained one of the neurosurgeons locally uh, in Dar es Salaam. And I believe that Dr. Mark Blessing is from Uganda. So can we go back to the general room in at Moy to have the presentation of Michael? Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you so much, Professor Wilco, uh, for having me around and um... Julia as well, eh? uh, we, we, we surely missed you being around and uh, talking about Bristol really brings very fond memories, having spent some two years uh, in Bristol. Uh, my my name is Blessing Michael Taremwa and I'm a neurosurgeon uh, from Uganda, uh, having trained within the region under the COSEXA program, which is basically the umbrella college uh, involving the East, Central and Southern African countries. My father uh, went ahead to um, specialize uh, uh, doing a fellowship in skull base and cerebrovascular surgery in India. And uh, later on, I did uh, an ISTP fellowship um, in the UK. Still, that has been a, a partnership with uh, the College uh, of uh, Surgeons East Central and Southern Africa, COSEXA, and uh, the Royal College of Surgeons of uh, England and Ireland. Uh, back home in Uganda, we are a country of around 48 million people and uh, having gone around uh, 17 neurosurgeons 
uh, with uh, three uh, neurosurgical centers. I, I currently practice at one of them, which is uh, in Imbarara, uh, and we are three consultant neurosurgeons in that center. We have just only started uh, training, uh, having been accredited by COSEXA, and uh, we have around uh, four trainees or four fellows in, in, uh, at the moment. Uh, I cannot uh, really underscore the need of um, joining the global neurosurgery movement, uh, just like my previous colleagues have said. Uh, we have grown uh, ever since I completed my training just because of the screening programs. Uh, when I had just finished training, uh, we were basically uh, able to do only some of the basic neurosurgical um, procedures uh, at my unit. And that, that has uh, gradually shifted to the current you know, surgeries that we're doing. Um, if I'm to borrow from uh, Professor Hato's previous presentation, uh, we've basically leapfrogged, you know, and uh, the reason we've done that is because of uh, partnership and training programs uh, such as this one that we're having. We have some partners back home. Uh, that's uh, the Duke uh, Global Neurosurgery. And uh, of recent, we've had uh, the Colorado team that has been here in, in Dar es Salaam uh, extending some of the courtesy visits uh, to Uganda, whereby we had the first uh, international neurosurgical conference. Uh, just uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, it is quite very important uh, when it comes to developing um, new surgery in the underdeveloped world uh, because it's quite costly having uh, trainees cross over to the developed world to, to train, uh, let alone the availability of such slots. So having such programs um, within the region uh, is very, very critical in terms of uh, advancing uh, one, the knowledge, and two, the skills of uh, the local neurosurgeons uh, that will later be transformed into serving the population. We have quite a very high disease burden, uh, and this has only been further unveiled by the advances in uh, uh, the radiological diagnostics, uh, whereby we are seeing more and more uh, complex neurosurgical um, conditions, uh, and hence uh, the need for even further super specialized training. Uh, like Professor Wilco said, uh, it's only of recent that we've started doing lots of uh, skull-based work uh, back home and uh, even here in Dar es Salaam. And uh, we, 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 we have very, very uh, strong bonds with uh, the division uh, back home and also the department here in Dar es Salaam, uh, whereby we have lots of um, exchange uh, programs. Uh, we have lots of trainings back and forth. Eh? And this has been actually also very key in uh, trying to improve uh, um, neurological care uh, and also advancing it to the more complex uh, procedures. Thank you, Michael. Um, so I think now we come at, uh, at the final moment of, um, of this meeting. Um, Magli, are you still there? I think you're sitting uh, besides uh, Besides Michael, I see you there. Yeah, I see your shoulder. So, so Max was very nervous that I would fail with with the internet that you would need need to take over. But now there's also some role for you because um, there are probably some people in the room there, and maybe they they have questions uh, to ask to the uh, to the panel. So, are there questions in the room? Absolutely. If there's anybody in the room, so you guys don't see it uh, through the Zoom, but we have a crowd over here uh, that came through the course. So we would be happy to take any questions and I can pass you the microphone. So in between, I have a question from the from the floor on internet. It's someone from Nepal, Dr. Jitanda Takur. He's asking how can we apply for a fellowship through the global and humanitarian nurse surgery? So that's maybe a question from Magnus uh, to answer. Is that already possible or difficult to arrange yet? Yeah, as I said, we currently, we have no funding. We have no budget. We have no fellowships. We can maybe, what we can do is to find a place in Europe where, where they have it, but the committee has nothing so far. No, and, and to add to that, indeed, that's true. And sometimes 
departments in our part of the world can host a fellow for yes. a short yes. period yeah. uh, on uh, on the with some cost and living on uh, based on the department. So that but that depends on the university. So that's exactly. Not so it's more uh, this no centrally financed European fellowship, but there are locally. There, yeah. there are the observerships or more common the fellowships, I think. Yeah. Uh, Thank but, you. But, but we can mediate uh, contacts. So. Yeah. so maybe we have to organize that for the future. So I go back to the room, Magli. Are there questions there in the room? I don't hear it. Can you can you repeat, Roger? I, no questions yeah. from the room, but I have a question for somebody in the room, if that's okay. Because yes. we have yeah. Francois Watercane who's sitting here. He he was a previous fellow before Julie, and he just you know he went back. He he came for a year and he spent one year here with his family and two boys, and uh, went back to 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 Belgium. And I was just going to ask him. Uh, what the impact was of that year that he spent here for him and for his family and going back. I remember there was a question whether they were going to keep the job for you, but they they kept the job and you went back. And I was just, it may be interesting for people to hear from you how, how that is being perceived and what the pros and cons and what, what your experience was. Thank you. Thank you for that question. So before coming here, I had uh, experience as a consultant in Belgium for almost 10 years. And then we decided for many reasons to um, with, to experiment it because I was interested in global health. And then I found that, that position and I applied and, and luckily um, I got the position and we moved here for one year with my whole family, my wife and my three kids. So it was challenging because of course I had to, to make sure that for my colleagues in Belgium, we won't be in they won't be in trouble because we were four neurosurgeons. If I left, there will be only three. And then it's for the on-call and everything you can imagine. It was quite tricky, but they accepted that. So um, uh, I came here for the whole year and then I took it back my position as a neurosurgeon in my previous hospital in Belgium. So what did I learn during this year? Um, I was, yeah. when I came here, I thought my position would be mostly training people over here with my experience, with my, my training I could have in Europe, but actually it was really a sharing experience. I think um, I could learn a lot of them. Basically, uh, the, the lack of uh, opportunity of having uh, investigation like MRI, CT scan or whatever, like we can have in our settings. Here they don't, most of the time they don't have so easy access to those uh, technologies. So they rely more on clinical and I was really impressed by the clinical assessment they, they were able to do with patients. Um, another thing was thanks to the collaboration with Cornell, I could be part of organization of those kind of meetings like we are having this week. And um, we also um, I had the opportunity to meet many other people from everywhere, like Andra Peter, I can see there. Uh, I had a good relation with him and it was very interesting for me. So back in Belgium now, I think I had uh, more confidence in managing um, the hospital, uh, managing the department, and um, it was really a very great experience. So thank you again for that. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for uh, sharing this great experience. Um, in between, there are two other questions uh, from the digital floor from the internet. One is from Broad Franklin. Have the outcomes of global neurosurgery twinning programs, like mentioned by Magnus, been published in the literature? Magnus, has it been published yet? Yeah, we, we have published a lot from, from Nigeria and uh, also, I think, from, Ga from Gambia now, actually. So, so yeah, we try to do it. Okay. And did you also publish that in the Global uh, Humanitarian Special Topic Issue? Yeah, we had something there. I think so. Okay. Okay. 
<laughs> so maybe maybe we can add something at brain and spine. So yeah. that's my own, that's my conflict of interest on the ENS side. Yeah. So now now a very difficult question, and that's for the whole panel to answer. A very difficult question is coming from Afghanistan, uh, from Sadikula Walitsai. Um, he's a neurosurgeon in Afghanistan, and he asked us uh, that the war torn country needs our help in the field of neurosurgery. How that is possible? Any program can be developed about my country. I think that's a very timely issue because there are some war going on throughout the world at different parts of the world where a lot of trauma is happening. So how, who can I give the phone? Roger, do you have an, any idea how to tackle this problem? The areas that need neurosurgery the most are difficult to reach. What's your opinion, Roger? Well, this is indeed a difficult problem because it has all these implications, obviously, for the terrible situation that's going on in those countries, that part of the world, which is really uh, the priority, of course, for us to consider. Uh, then, but then also from the other side, how, how are you going to help the, the people, the surgeons, the infrastructure over there? I mean, what I what I come up with just spontaneously now is just obviously, you know, the inter, in the Internet, right? Uh, as, as long there is a capacity or a possibility to communicate, there should be also the ability to help if you have, but then you need, obviously need to talk to the right people at the right time and you have to have that technical capability, uh, which may be a challenge, uh, but that seems to me like the obvious answer to that question. Uh, and, and beyond that, it may be very difficult to do that. It really, you, I, I don't think you can expect anybody to really go physically there you know there's some people who would do that which is amazing but i think you can't expect that you know reasonably so but but by 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 internet by uh i think with exchange of films if specific questions i think you should be able to help in certain situations yeah thank you very much um i see Ondra moving uh, his head so Ondra, want you also want uh, did you want to add something to that uh, like not an uh, Unfortunately, not particular in uh, to to this other Afghanistan's question yet, but but I just wanted uh, to say that uh, our, our committee uh, have uh, have now started to to collect the, the information uh, regarding the institutions either from Europe or from low income countries who might be or who are interested in such programs then we can connect the 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 the, uh, the right institutions and so on and we can facilitate uh, the 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 humanitarian aid so so that's why like like as a as a perhaps the first step or or a, as a start uh, please contact us, uh, us uh, like uh, via email or whatsoever. Uh, like uh, the the contacts are on the website, and then then uh, we can we can just talk uh, about these particular pro problems. What do you mean, uh, Magnus? For example, yeah, what, yeah. what do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Um... I think, I mean, the, the main thing in a cooperation is who you cooperate with. And uh, I think it's a personal connection to the one in the other country that is the most important and that works. And the second thing is, of course, you need to have support from as high as possible. Uh, I mean, Department of Health, uh, hospital director, uh, and so forth. Uh, so, so so that makes it much, much easier, especially in an unstable situation. Uh, so, so we started out in Nigeria. That was they have some places that are not so good, and some places that are better. And and but they always been feel very safe due to the people I work with. So, so, so I, I think that is the most to find the right uh, companions, to find the right partners, and then you can yeah. most fix. Yes. It's very good that you say that because uh, you have experience in Nigeria. I also have experience with fellows from Nigeria, but I personally was a little bit afraid after being in a war situation. So um, so I'm um, hoping that all the people, all neurosurgeons and also neurosurgical patients in the world will have their chance 
to be trained. And I think for the, uh, I think there's no question anymore in the room, Magali, I think. Can I add something to the yeah, question please, yeah. about Afghanistan? So I was very privileged recently um, to attend the first WFNS Global Neurosurgery Conference in Peshawar in Pakistan. And actually there was good representation from Afghanistan at that meeting, just to say. And I know the WFNS um, had done some work in various different aspects of trying to support the Afghan neurosurgeons. And I realize this is an EANS webinar, but the Europe, Europe sits within the world as well. Um, and often it's the countries I think that are closest that are most able to help. So it's facilitating people to help each other. I know the WFNS committee had done some great work with trying to support the female trainees in Afghanistan, actually. Yeah. I think that's yeah, really very good. Important. Very good that you say that I was also involved in WFNS um, and also early in the Peshawar. But that was all also a difficult situation at that moment. And uh, people want to be trained. And I think that's the question also, uh, if they can have the same amount of training. And what Roger was saying, probably by internet and using uh, the privilege to use that might be uh, one of the solutions. So we come at the end of the hour. And um, if there are no other questions in the, uh, in the meeting room, then I would, um, well, I want to finish this meeting um i propose that our movie our short movie of 10 minutes of the interview of last year in moy will be placed online together with this uh, with this webinar and i thank all the speakers um on behalf of the eans also the section of global humanitarian surgery and also very much the group in dar es salaam led by uh, dr ruta and with the help of roger with a very good and developed course. Thank you all. And um, I hope to see you next time somewhere in the world uh, where it is uh, more convenient than where I'm now. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye, congratulations. Bye-bye, Lucas.